In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Tradition tells us that Jesus' earthly ministry was just three short years long. And I've often w wondered how that discussion would take place at a clergy conference at that time. I know how Episcopal clergy behave at clergy conferences, sometimes very saintly and sometimes not so. They might say, well, it was a pretty short term and it didn't end very well, did it? But Jesus' ministry was mainly to God's chosen people, the Jews. And that's what he saw his ministry to be, but uh, he did venture up to Tyre and Sidon, uh, which is really the heart of darkness in terms of that time and in that place. Uh, uh, you might, if you ever ventured into Long Beach, California in the 40s and 50s, uh, you probably saw a pretty good image of Tyre and Sidon. It was not a nice place. They were Gentiles, first of all, which put them outside of uh, Jesus' realm of earthly ministry. And they were a very uh, corrupt, superstitious, and deceiving and hateful group of people. And yet Jesus spent roughly uh, one-eighth of his earthly ministry there. It's kind of amazing. And he did that to fulfill one of Isaiah's prophecy, that he would be a light to the nations, not to, just to the Jewish nations, but to all people. And so Jesus went there to uh, be a spark of light in this place of darkness. <clears throat> and there he did some interesting things. Remember the Syrophoenician woman came, and, came to him and was be beseeching Jesus on behalf of her daughter who was near death. And at first Jesus rebuked her, didn't he? He said, I've come to my own people to minister to my own people. And she said something that was very touching to Jesus' heart. She said, even the dogs are able to eat the crumbs from the master's table. And all of a sudden Jesus, you can see that his ministry was widened because of that. In other words, his heart was opened to a far vast uh, ministry than what he initially thought. Incidentally, at that time, people didn't place a, a linen napkin on your lap at dinner. They gave you bread, and you used bread to cleanse your hands. And sometimes those crumbs fell uh, to the floor of the table where you were eating, and that's when the dogs did their cleanup job of which our little dog does a beautiful job of cleanup at our house. In fact, that's her main job, cleanup. But nevertheless, Jesus' ministry is expanded. And so after that plea, Jesus healed that young girl. But now he's back in his home territory, which mainly took place around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and, and especially near that fishing town of Capernaum. And if you were ever, ever able to travel to the Holy Land and go to Capernaum, you could actually walk through the remains of the old synagogue there. And remember that that synagogue was not built by Jewish money, but by Roman money. Remember it was the, the head of that Roman guard who built that synagogue for those people. It's a wonderful story of how his life had been touched by living amongst believers. But anyway, in these stories from Tyre and Sidon and then back into uh, the land of the Jews, we have an opportunity to see three transformations. The first is the transformation that in a sense happens to Jesus. His ministry expands because his heart is open by the pleas of that woman beseeching, not on her own behalf, but on the behalf of her child. Now we hear about the deaf man who has a speech impediment. And generally deaf people do have a speech impediment because they're not able to hear very well. And over the years, I have become that man. 
wearing glasses, hearing aids, not always picking up on all the conversations that are around me, and yet I smile and, and nod. <laughs> and I usually do that when someone's telling something very dreadful, you know, and they think, boy, Father Kramer doesn't have much of a heart, does he? No. But anyway, Jesus takes this man aside, and he does something very tender and private. He puts his fingers in the man's ears. He makes an anointment of spittle and clay and anoints the man. And he looks up to heaven, beseeching his heavenly father to intervene on behalf of this man. And the man is healed. And all of a sudden, he has a throat now, doesn't he? He's praising the Lord, and there's not anything in the world that would cause this man to shut up. He's interested in praising the Lord God Almighty, and he does that in a big way. Now, I think the third transformation is the transformation of the disciples. In a sense, they were deaf to Jesus' words and mute, not able to praise Jesus. And yet, all of a sudden, slowly but surely, they're able to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And when, and when Peter proclaims, you are my Lord, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ of God, is that he's finally getting it. And so are the other disciples. Friends, doesn't it begin when we're open to God's word? Ephatha, that Aramaic word that says be open. And when we're open, we're open to great joy and we're open to great sorrow. Because when we're open, we take in everything. And that's the ministry that you and I are called to, is to be open to God's word and to be open to the needs of our fellow human beings. In other words, not to turn our eye away from suffering and not to close our ears when we hear pleas of help, is that God and Christ wants us to be open not only to see God's majesty and to hear his word proclaimed, but to praise him and to tell others about our relationship with the holiness. But as we know, As we follow Christ and try our very level best to live the life of Christ, we cannot be separated from that which fell upon our Lord, crucifixion. We may not be nailed to a cross, in fact it's very doubtful, but we will be nailed to lots of little crosses, lots of little sorrows, and we need to embrace that and not run away from the sufferings that humanity has in store for us. Now, like a lot of clergy of my generation, we were never offered sabbatical time. And when churches finally got around to understanding that sabbatical for their clergy is important for their own refreshment and for doing scholarly work, I was within three years of retiring, but I took one anyway. It was offered, and I took it, and I realized scholarly work was too late for me. And so I did something else. I took time for refreshment and worship. When you're a worship leader, it's very difficult to worship. That may seem kind of strange to you, but it's, it, it is, because you're always looking ahead. You know, when the people are doing the prayers of the people, you're kind of looking at the confession coming up. You're always a step or two ahead. And so in my sabbatical, Mary and I, we decided to spend our time worshiping. Instead of being worship leaders, we would go and be fed. We went to Orthodox churches. We went to Pentecostal churches. We went to cowboy churches. We went to no-name churches, Bible churches, which we all know are really Baptist churches, right? (laughs) 
Anyway, we went and we were fed, and I did something that's very difficult for clergy to do, is that I did not keep score. I accepted it the way it was presented, and I can tell you that I loved every minute of worship in lots of different churches. It was magnificent and beautiful. People using lots of different ways to share one principal fact, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and it's through his sacrifice that our lives have meaning. Now, as we were finishing up our sabbatical and on our way back to our home, we went through uh, back to Yosemite, one of our favorite places on earth. I think one of the greatest national parks in our park system, namely because it's so compacted Everything is right there in that valley to see. And as many of you know, when you enter into Yosemite Valley, the first waterfalls are the uh, Bridal Veil waterfalls on the right. And it's always our practice to stop there, and we walk up the path to the base of the, of the Bridal Falls. And one of the things about the Bridal Falls is though there's a huge falling of water the water very seldom makes it down in one form. The wind blows it, and it becomes like a bridal veil. In other words, it's very ethereal. And at the base of the bridal falls are huge boulders that have fallen down over the years. And amidst those boulders are signs, warning, do not climb on the boulders, danger. And so we, we stayed there at the base of the falls for a while, then we were walking back. And when we were back a ways, we turned to gaze upon them again. And walking down the path was a park ranger. And I could tell by the expression on his face that something was terribly wrong. Now remember, I'm on sabbatical, a leave of, of uh, duty from ministry. And I let him walk by me. And then the Lord caught me up, and I went after him, and I said, Sir, I can tell that you're having a lousy day. And he turned around, and he said, A boy fell on the rocks and died. I said, Can I be of any help? I'm an Episcopal minister, and if you need me, I will help out. He said, How much time do you have? I said, All the time necessary. So I went back to the ranger station, and it wasn't long before... Uh, two boys showed up with the ranger. Stephen had fallen from the rocks and died. And his brother and his cousin, who were making this wonderful road trip from Phoenix, Arizona, to go to Yosemite and go to Disneyland and other places, and then all of a sudden this awful tragedy. And so we embraced each other, uh, all with tears in our eyes, and we prayed for Stephen, we prayed for each other, and we gave thanks to God for Stephen's life. Ephatha, being open. I have to admit, for a minute, I was not open for that. But God opened me up. And as painful as it was, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God was able to use me in his ministry. You see, being open to God means that we're never on sabbatical, that we have to always be in the ministry of Jesus Christ, that we have to be made open and more open and more open until our arms are wide open. Open to love, and open to the hurts of the world. I think the old hymn, the precious hymn, says it so very well. There's a wideness in God's mercy. For the love of God is broader than the measure of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were more faithful, we should take him at his word and our life would be thanksgiving for the goodness of the Lord. 
Brothers and sisters, our life in Christ must be full of moments of transition and transformation. And the only way those moments of transformation that can happen in our lives is for us to be open. Ephatha. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.